thanks for staying with us. Now, agitation should never precede education because when it does, it leads to chaos, births, robbery, kidnap, looting, vandalism, as we've seen play out in the last one week across our nation. Now, if we really want a new Nigeria, what is the way forward? Let us hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join this conversation. Tweet at us at Plus TV Africa or at Wayshow Africa One with the hashtag Wayshow or send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081 803 In two minutes, I'm going to bring in our guest. So, Olamide, quickly, what do you think the way forward should be if we want to birth the new Nigeria? Okay. Um, oh, I'm going to be very brutal in my analysis. First, I would say that we are all complicit in this matter, in what has happened. What has happened over the past few days is to send a strong message to the elites, the professional elites, the business elites. We have not done enough for the people that we label downtrodden. I'm sorry to say, we shouldn't call anybody downtrodden. They are just victims of bad leadership over the years. These are people that could have been doctors, that could have been IT technologists, that could have been lawyers. But bad leadership changed their destiny. Nobody likes to be on the streets. It's hard to, it's hard to be on the streets. So what has happened in the past couple of weeks is sending a message to us that quite a number of people have ignored them. And I would dare to say that this NSAS came about because it, was a big, it, it tends to become... It, sorry, it turned into a big man's problem. That was why everybody went to the streets. There are lots of issues that, that, that affect people at the lower cadre, but have not been given any national prominence about, uh, 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 sorry, that has not been given national prominence by the elites because it was not their problem. When the roads are bad, we buy jeeps. When the schools are bad, we take our children to private schools. During summer, we are out of the country. When there's no light, you have a 120 kVA generator. So we don't have, we don't, there's nothing, we, we have not done anything to showcase the plight of the ordinary common man in Nigeria. The SARS problem came to national prominence because it was not affecting people that had jeeps, that had C classes, and all that. So when the protest stopped, they protested. That was another protest because they felt they were going to channel it towards the, the problems, the basic problems we had in Nigeria. But the emphasis was on NSAS, and okay, they so, saw beyond that. So let, they because, we have, because we have a little the time. Core, all the problems that was confronting us. All, how many people, we as people, how many of us do we carry, do we carry with us, do we carry along Okay, so let me, who, because we're running out, because we have a little time, <laughs> so... Let me hear Isi's um, distance before I bring in a lot of For here. me, the way forward to end this madness or this um, problem we are facing in Nigeria currently, I think it should start from the home. The mindset of the children, the mindset of the family should be reorientated and children should be taken to school. Look at the situation whereby an individual who, was, who went to sell or give them pure water or water while they were protesting. That's a typical example of you know, changing the mindset. The boy said he wanted to go to school and he wanted them to keep fighting so that they can go to school. So the way forward is we are orientating the whole family setup and we as parents, we shouldn't fail the younger generation that are coming up. That is the way forward. All right, so Ola And give them a good education. Um, Ola Kunle Shorio is a polymath, iconoclast, catalytic thought leader, and a keynote speaker whose expression spans across the globe as it influences and shapes culture, you know, globally. Thank you so much again for joining us this evening. He's joined us for a second time, two nights in a row, because we have to find practical solutions and, you know, intelligent solutions, not just falling, displaying the same cards over and over again. Thank you so much, Ola Kunle Shorio, for joining us again. Thank you. Thank you, Uwa. Thank you, ladies. Thank you all for Thank you for joining us. So, Kunle Sharia, so you, I want you to pick up from what Olamide said. I want you to pick up from what Olamide said. If you can just, you know, yes. th throw a bit of light on that. Because um, she is saying that this only hit us when it was now touching the elite. Do you agree with that? Well, you know, I, I, I don't think so. I think that maybe it brought it from our subconscious to our conscious mind. 
because, you know, the restlessness of the people at the bottom of the triangle has always been there. If you look at the last um, um, crisis that was going on with Nigerians in South Africa, the... Xenophobia. What is it Just let my mind. What's that the word? Xenophobia. The xenophobia. Is xenophobia. With non-black South Africans and how Nigerians were being killed. The same thing happened on a lower scale, what I call a lower resolution of the same thing. The shop, the malls were attacked in Lekki. A lot of things, guys were attacked in. So we've always, even the issues we face with, you know, um, people just r running, 100 people busting into traffic and robbing everybody, you know, like that in traffic. All of those things are, they've been there, right? I think this, um, because it has um, every eye on it, right, has brought it from our subconscious. Why do the rich as well and the elites have Mopo in their house, secure policemen following them everywhere? Because they are aware as well that safety has to be managed at a level that transcends the limits of what the security structure can offer. You see, so it's there. And when you look at it, Everyone is a victim of a vicious, harsh system, right? The, those who have Mopo by their side, they are victims too. You see, the, the challenges in our history has conditioned us to think strictly survival and to think like in the jungle, right? Is the survival of the fittest. The lion wakes up in the morning, they say, with the mindset that he must outrun the fastest gazelle. Then the gazelle wakes up in the morning with the mindset that if he's going to survive, he must outrun the fastest lion, right? That jungle mentality is what thrives in our societies. And so everybody's just looking for space. You know, I am not going to be part of the idea that we have to point fingers. I'm not a finger pointing person. I think crisis calls us to mental weaponry and inner clarity to take higher responsibility. And so what we have to do is to consider everybody to point fingers seeking where the two out did could have done better or did not do much or where anyone needs to measure up may not be enough. So we have to come into one place. The police officers are victims. The protesters are victims, right? It's just like two dead bodies trying to enter one coffin and struggling for space in one single coffin. It's still, it's still, a, it's still a coffin and they are still dead, mm -hmm. right? So that is why way forward conversations are key. Conversations about how do we go forward? How do we navigate are key, are critical. A lot of the guys who are shouting protest today don't even know how much of the evil in the system is already inside of them. You see people who have pledged, I will never marry a second wife because my father married a second wife. Then they criticize that all their youth years, only for them to begin to build their own dynasty. And before they know what is happening, they already have two girlfriends with two babies. And the old thing, you see, we always underrate how much the system has us. If these guys, some of them get into government, you'll be surprised at how they will crack and, 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 and do the same thing and recycle the same thing. So we need to think bigger and operate from an helicopter view so that we can focus on the issue and solve the problems as necessary and critical. Okay, yeah. so when we are saying we're thinking bigger, so what do we start as a step? Because yesterday you mentioned something about agitation, preceding education, you know, and that was very powerful for me because I held on strong to it to say, you know what, I think that is somebody's finally be beginning to give me an understanding on what we should be looking forward to in terms of solutions. So what would that way forward look like? Yeah, the, the, the way forward is very critical. And like you said, you know, and I emphasized strongly yesterday, we, we have to be careful to understand that efforts are a necessary part of all mobilization and, and, and organization. But efforts are not independent variables. They are dependent because you can make a lot of efforts that does not give you the results you are looking for. You can prepare a gun. You can load it with bullets. You can go into the jungle to go kill a ram. If you stay in the jungle all night trying to kill an antelope, and then in the morning you return shot all your bullets, you didn't catch any, 
It's not for lack of effort. It is for lack of precision in that you have missed the critical goal and that it is not managed well can create what I call labor loss. So we want to ensure that two plus two should give us four. Four is our goal. We should not console ourselves if we don't get to the target. And so uh, that is my challenge with agitation that lacks education as its background. So um, can everyone hear me, though? I we can hear you. We can hear you. Yes, we can. We can hear yes, you clearly. Great. Great. You know, so, so part, of, part of the reality is education of the masses. I said it very strongly yesterday. At the end of the day, when it comes to national transformation, efforts like nation building, right? When it comes to societal reformation and stuff like that, you know, particularly in a third world country, you have to understand that there is a very weak, large number of people at the bottom of the triangle, right? And those people are suffering critically from ignorance, fear, obesity, and poverty. It's a bad combination. When you have a large, you are talking about over a hundred million people at the bottom of the triangle that are struggling with poverty, that are struggling with chronic ignorance of themselves and of their environment. They are struggling with fear and anxiety. They are struggling with obesity, right? When you have all of that, you know, on one spot inside one person is too much. So they, before, you, if you bring any agitation on top of that, you had better stay in control of that agitation all through. Because if you shut your eyes for one moment, all of that will erupt into, you know, an earthquake that even you, the owner of the agitation, cannot control. Mm -hmm. And that is okay. what happened. For as long as the um, for as long as the protesters, um, the elite conscious protesters were in charge of the protest, the guys were there or they were calm. We must also understand that they were also infiltrated by outsiders, which is another symposium discussion. Mm -hmm. But all of that is not the way forward. You know, there are some key steps we're going to go into if we have the time. But I guess um, somebody is trying to say something. So I should yes, pause. please, sir. I wanted to ask you, so what is education to you? How do we educate the masses to actually reorientate their mind and make them understand that that is not the way to go, to go about looting, um, causing all kinds of ruckus around uh, yeah. the nation? Great. So, so how do we educate them? OK, let, let's, let's first agree on what education is, right? The, the education I'm talking about is not academics, please. Exactly. Cannot happen in a classroom. I'm talking about informal education. Mm -hmm. And the objective is to take the masses to a place of consciousness where each one can experience its environment, number one. Two, can question it enough to find the options that exist in it. And then amongst those options, to know the ones to embrace as a matter of supreme importance and urgency. That is education. If you cannot experience your environment, if you cannot question your environment deep enough to create options, and then to know the ones to embrace as a matter of supreme importance and urgency, you are not educated, even if you have a PhD. And by that definition, even some of the conscious elites are not educated. Some of the people in front of agitation in our history are not educated enough. It's not about being a lawyer. It's not about being an accountant. It's having that consciousness and nimbleness to interpret the impact that is before you. And that is what is going on when you say a country is a first world country. Essentially, is the idea that beyond formal education, a lot of people do have clarity about the issues that govern the socioeconomic realities and political realities of the people of that environment. So what I'm talking about is organizing to offer that education. Now, this education is short term and long term. 
right? Exactly. It's, not just, it's not something Absolutely. that can be achieved in a day. And there are some key assumptions that have to be defeated for that education to take effect. I don't know if you want me to go into that right now. Or no. somebody wants to talk So I think um, we'll, we'll, not, we'll just go. Uh, <laughs> PK, I'm can you hear me? I'm to give back the mic because <laughs> yes, well, so. I, 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 I harassed me yesterday. So I'm trying not to. I'm happy. Point. I'm happy you're bringing back the mic to us. So we are going to come to Lamy, but we'll take a very short break, very short break. When we return, Lamy would ask a question. Stay with us. We'll be right back.